Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to welcome um, Sister Natalie Beckhart to our briefing today. Um, thank you so much, Sister Natalie, for giving up an hour to be with us. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm joined as host and interviewer by Christopher Lamb, whose questions may have a slightly more specialist and forensic quality than mine. Um, and please do um, put any questions that you've got in the chat box and we'll either come to you and ask them to put them to Sister Natalie directly, or we may group questions together and field them that way. Um, a very, this is not a full biography, but uh, Sister Natalie Beckhardt is a Catholic sister. She's a member of the Congregation of Saviors. She studied in Boston and Paris. She oversaw the National Service for the Evangelization of Young People and Vocations in France for several years. And in February, Pope Francis appointed her as an undersecretary to the Synod of Bishops. As such, she will be the first woman ever to have a vote in the Synod of Bishops. And I think that is due, pandemic allowing, to meet next year. Um, now, if she sprinkles her answers with metaphors of plain sailing, choppy seas or changing tack, well, be assured that as a sailor, she knows what she's talking about. So, um, Sister Natalie, um, I'll try not to speak too fast, by the way, because of course you're going to be conducting this conversation in, in English. Um, I'd like to start by asking you about the significance of your appointment. There are a few women now in very visible roles in the Vatican, um, but this one is, is, uh, is really key. Um, as I said, you're going to be the first woman to have a vote in the Synod of Bishops. Um, what, just could you give a very brief idea of what your role is going to entail or what it entails? Well, the, the secret, General Secretariat of the Synod of Bishop is a kind of permanent team uh, to serve to the preparation, the organization uh, of uh, the different synods. So at this moment, this team uh, is with uh, 13 people. So it's first being part of this uh, crew, of this team, and as uh, yeah. under secretary, we, we are, uh, you know, now we are two with Cardinal Greg, who is the general secretariat. We, we are a kind of leadership team for this uh, general secretariat. Uh, and our main task is, uh, so my role is to be involved and to uh, prepare the next synod on the synodality. And so, in a way, it's particularly symbolic, isn't it? Um, it says something about the whole concept of um, synodality, which we'll talk about in a moment, that, that, that as a woman you are in this role. There's something very symbolic about that in the way that maybe appointing a woman as the head of museums isn't. Yes, maybe because, you know, uh, synodality is mainly, and we can talk more about it, uh, it's a vision of the church where, uh, in which all are involved, all the batailles are protagonists, uh, all the people of God are together, working together. Uh, and Pope Francis puts a very uh, great emphasis on listening to the people of God, what we call in a technical term, the census fidei, that means all the baptized together, all the people of God have a sense of the face, a true sense of the face. And so being, um, and the idea for Pope Francis is that the leaders, so the pastors as Pope, bishops, or uh, even uh, different uh, pastors in, in parishes, they can't lead uh, they can't be pastor without being among the people and truly listening to them. So that means that uh, it's very important uh, when you prepare a synod uh, to have a, a strong uh, preparation phase to consult and to associate people to the decision making process. And I feel that uh, the appointment I have received, you know, as a woman, uh, I am part of the, even if I am a sister, I am not uh, a cleric, <laughs> I am a uh, lay. And uh, that's a way to, um, to put in the structure of the synod, this emphasis on uh, connected uh, with and listening to 
uh, all the people of God, because the, the pastors and the clerics are part of the people of God. And, so it, uh, and the word synodality, it, it doesn't exactly, uh, it's not a very easy word. I mean, I don't think people necessarily come across it outside um, the context of talking about the church, but we're talking about listening, consultation, participation, um, discernment, that's right. Yes, exactly. We can remember that, the, in fact, the, the theme of the next synod, uh, it's, it's a kind of sentence, it's for a synodal church, communion, participation, mission. And those th three words uh, give us an idea of what is synodality. It's to build a communion, so the aim of a synod, the aim of a synodal process is to build communion. But a communion that is missionary, that is in fact our role and, and the, all the purpose of synodality and, and of different kind of synods is to, um, it is for the mission, for the service of the society, of the common good, of our common home. So uh, it's always a missionary synodality. And to, to, to meet uh, the challenges of this time, uh, nobody alone can do it. So we have to be together in this synodal way uh, to act together because uh, th that's the only way. And Pope Francis states clearly that this broken world, very fragmented, divided, needs um, more synergy and a, a culture of encounter, of dialogue, of fraternity. So when we speak about synodality, we speak about a style of church. It's also a path of renewal, and it's a way to be the church in this time. In fact, uh, church and synod are synonym, but uh, it, it's, we can say it's the historic face of the church, and it's a dynamic vision of a church on the move to serve all the people. I guess the, the, the question and maybe um, the sticking point is how are decisions reached? Um, who, who makes the decisions in the end? We're, it's, we're not talking about broad, or maybe we are talking about broad consensus, but who makes the decisions in the end and where does authority ultimately lie? Do, will the people who take part in these synods um, Will you, as someone taking part in these synods, feel that you really have the authority and power to make the decisions that the church needs to be making? Well, we can say the, the way to make decisions uh, within this uh, synodal style, in fact, uh, is discernment. So it's a process. And um, in fact, the true way to envision decisions uh, taking in the church is of course, at the end, like in all the organizations, you need someone who presides, someone who has the ultimate responsibility. But if you are in this vision of leaders, you know, uh, who are not separated from the community, but who are among uh, the, the people and who are uh, discerning together, you have a way to make decision that is through this uh, synodal path that reach consensus. And there is a beautiful word from one of your great theologians in, uh, in England, I want to mention, uh, Cardinal Newman, uh, who was among the first to think about the importance of uh, this census fidei, that means the, the role, uh, the sense of faith of all the batailles. And he talked about, in Latin, it's conspiratio, so it's conspiration. So that means the way to, to, to discern the right decisions are um, uh, embracing together. And the one who ultimately uh, promulgates the decision or takes the, the final decision, in fact, it, it's not, is not external from all this process, you know. So uh, what I would like to say is, of course, you can have, um, and for instance, it's important to have in mind 
that a council uh, like uh, Vatican II uh, is a body that uh, can take decisions. Okay, the synod of bishops or a, a diocesan synod is only a deliberative body, <laughs> but usually, you know, at the end, uh, the we can see Pope Francis uh, uh, promulgate uh, and post-synodal exhortation based on all the synodal uh, paths. And in a diocese, usually the, the bishop promulgates the, the orientations uh, taken together. Um, so it, it, what is difficult is that we, and it's, it's normal, we have in mind a way to think about decisions in uh, secular bodies, but in the church that is a human or divine reality, <laughs> Uh, we have to change a little bit our mindset. Right. I'm going to bring in Christopher here um, to um, push on a couple of those questions. Christopher. Thank you, and uh, good to see you, Sister Natalie. Um, I'd like to ask you about some of the examples of synodality that we're seeing around the world, and in particular, the German synodal path. That It seems the impression that I'm getting is that people in Rome, some people in Rome are very nervous about what's happening in Germany, because the German synodal path is looking at questions about uh, how power is exercised, about questions around sexuality. How do you in your office view the German synodal path? And could you just give us your, your, your take on that? Well, it, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, the synodal past is on the way. So it's, it's a process. <laughs> Um, in, in our office, we consider that it's very important to, uh, to be in contact with all the local churches to serve and to accompany, if they, if they want, uh, synodal processes. Uh, so we are interested to, to see uh, how different kind of synodal process are happening now. So, uh, you know, for, for the moment, there is not... not uh, you know, an official uh, <laughs> connection, but uh, of course we, we, we try to understand the way they do this uh, synodal pass uh, to be there if they, if they want, uh, as we do with the plenary council in uh, Australia now, that is also a very important uh, uh, synodal process uh, for uh, the Church of Australia. And because, uh, you know, uh, within synodality, it's, it's a way also to think about the church as uh, with a kind of circularity between all the levels of the church. I just want so, to... Well, well, the, oh, sorry. Maybe the only thing I can say is that, for instance, it's interesting to, um, to see that some uh, experiences and process uh, from the Synod of Bishop, uh, for instance, Synod on Youth, have been implemented in the Synodal Pass in Germany. For instance, the decision to have a silent time uh, regularly after uh, speeches. I, I guess the, the problem is, um, or how it might seem to us, is that the, the circularity that you talk about gets some um, sort of cut off um, if the Synods, you know, uh, um, approach the congregation for the doctrine of faith on a particular issue, and then are, are told, no, this is this is the answer. Um, you know, it, it it appears to close down discussion when what's coming up from the, the grassroots up are people saying we we really need to discuss this more, and we don't. You know, it's not necessarily helpful to be told no. Um, so, I mean, how do you respond to that? Well, the only thing I know is that. Uh... You know, the synodal pass in Germany, as, as, I, as, as I said, is, is, uh, is on the, the move. So they continue the synodal process. Uh, there is no, for what I have known, there is a, the, the congregation of faith does its work uh, and they, they have given an answer to a specific question, but nobody knows that this question is coming from Germany. You know, it, it, we, we don't know. So maybe it, it, it was a, a question from uh, elsewhere. We don't know. So, uh, you know, in, in the, we can say that um, uh, we, we are, 
the synodal path in Germany is one thing <laughs> in a local church. Okay, the, the congregation of faith uh, deliver one statement, but uh, it's- So the discussion it's, remains open, does it? It seems. It seems, you know. But it's, uh, it, 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 it seems that, that the CDF has sort of just closed it down. I, I can't say that, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the church, in the church you have uh, also uh, a kind of, from the beginning, a plurality of approach, uh, a plurality of bodies, and uh, the, the church is not a, a monolithic uh, body <laughs> you know there are, so there are different positions different roles and people are trying to fulfill their role although you have germany which is moving ahead on some things very very swiftly um we also also see in the church some um countries which don't seem to be responding at all to the invitation to synodality. And I know that um, Cardinal Grech has written to all the bishops' conferences, offering uh, the availability of the office of the Synod of Bishops. What, what, what is going on, do you think, um, or what can, what can you do to encourage uh, countries around the world which don't seem to want to do synodality. I mean, it, it, we seem to have different, a lot of different speeds going on here. There's almost some resistance uh, in in some places. What is your response to trying to encourage people, some churches who are who are just not, it don't seem to be interested at all in 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 this idea, despite the Pope saying that synodality is what the church should be should be focusing on. Uh, yes, thank you for, the, for this question. You know, what is very important to have in mind is, uh, as you say, the, the church is present in all the countries, almost in the world, in different culture. And um, th there is a, a very important link between synodality and culture. So there is not only one way to apply synodality. Uh, different churches have different history, social context, political context. For instance, if you are in a country with dictatorship or, uh, you know, the experience of, uh, for instance, communism during many, many years, it has shaped a way of thinking, of relating to the other, of considering uh, power and authority. It's different if you are in a country with uh, a very long history of uh, democracy, for instance. And so we, we have to take into account uh, about cultures, local context, and synodality is truly, and that's the view of the Pope, uh, that you also put a greater emphasis on local churches. Um, so uh, the, the, the way we, which we are trying to think about the next synod, uh, how this synod can help to implement synodality, it's coming from the, you know, the vision of Episcopalis Communio, that is uh, the constitution on the Synod of Bishop just promulgated in 2018, September. Uh, thinking about the Synod, it's not only a meeting of bishop in Rome during one month, it's a process with a long preparation phase. So we will really try to encourage uh, for the preparation of the Synod that local churches have uh, also synodal processes. You know. But it, it's encouragement, support, and uh, as, as you know, uh, in all the, the organizations, change is difficult, you know? So when you have a call for, to change, you have also some resistance and you have different contexts, people, but uh, it's clear nowadays that most of the people, in fact, want this new way of being church as a synod of church. Um. Well, one area I think is that, that we could see development over through synodality is this whole question of working with other churches and denominations, because many other Christian churches have synodal processes. Um, do you think we could see, or the church could see, um, 
more collaboration with or more involvement of other denominations and churches in the Catholic Church's synodal process? Could it open up new partnerships, do you think, or new new ways for ecumenism? Uh, Yes, because we can uh, really say that ecumenism is uh, one of the many issues also of uh, synodality. And uh, in Pope Francis' key speech uh, about synodality, but it's one of the most important speech of all his pontificate, it's the speech for the 50th uh, anniversary of the institution of the Synod of Bishops, so September uh, uh, 17 in uh, 2015. Um, he, he, he says that, that uh, synodality, this, this way is also uh, a way to continue the dialogue with the other uh, denominations and to find the way, uh, he says, you know, the, the papacy, the patron ministry, has still to find uh, its style. And uh, so I really think that, you know, the key word to think about synodality is reciprocity. The church has to learn uh, from uh, other parts of the society uh, about participation process. Of course, you can't just copy and pass uh, because the church has to discern it uh, her own way. But we have to learn also from other denomination uh, churches that have this experience of, of synod and synodality. Uh, I'm thinking of the Anglican Church, but also the Orthodox Church, even the Oriental churches. But with this way, also with this reciprocity. I remember recently a conversation I had with a Protestant theologian telling me, of course, we have some kind, maybe more synodal structure, but the question of power and authority is still a a challenge in our church, and we should talk together about that. It can be helpful. So so yes, we really hope that uh, synodality will go along with uh, more and more dialogue uh, and uh, between the denominations. Could I ask uh, on the question of of the inclusion of women um, and where the synodal debates are going, um, and looking at your role, can we see a distinction between the governance of the church by priests, by or the ordained, and a role for the governance of the church by those who are not ordained. Could we see, at the, mo- at the moment, governance is all linked to those who are ordained. The power is with the ordained. Can we see a new space be created for the non-ordained to take governance and leadership? Yes, we can already see that and, uh, uh, we, we inherit from a very long history, as you say, uh, a time in which uh, governments and ordination were connected. Okay, but it has already changed, you know, and uh, we can see that in local churches. I can give you an example um, in France because I have spent most of my life in France. We, uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, all the bishop council, that is the main body for bishop to, uh, to consult and to, to have this decision-making process, there, there were only priests. Now in France, I think almost uh, 50% of the, of the bishop council in the different dioceses, they have women and lay people. So of course, it, it, you have different, um, uh, perception of the same uh, situation or problem and you discuss together. So what I want to say is that Pope Francis is clearly uh, now appointing uh, women and lay people in leadership role. Uh, today, today maybe you have seen that, Sister Alessandra Smerily, uh, who I know rather well, we were together at the Synod on Young People. She has been appointed under secretary uh, to the Dicastery for Human Development. Uh, the a big uh, 
decision was also to uh, appoint Paolo Ruffini, a layman, as the head of the Dicastery for Communication. So there is, but in fact, of course, when you, you have different vocations, you are a man, a woman, a lay, a, a religious, you don't have exactly the same perception. But for me, the most important is that, especially in this time of crisis, in this situation of a, of a changing world, nobody alone can decide alone. Uh, so the key issue is how you work in a more collegial way, in a more synodal way, and that implies teamwork. And, and the big change for me, and I think it's very symbolic that Pope Francis has appointed instead of one under secretary, because before you know, the Synod of Bishop, it was always a general secretary and a bishop as under secretary. We have been applied, we have been appointed two, a man, a woman, two religious. So it's mainly about this um, very important way to work as a team uh, in a team. I think, um, I mean, one, it's very striking that, you know, that the Pope is making um, these appointments of women to um, key offices um, and that this idea of synodality is, is very much driven by him. How much is it's rolling out dependent on him? How much um, is this a sort of um, immovable movement now? Or how much could it all be set back if um, we get another Pope who has a rather different idea about the way that things should be? I mean, do you see this process very much dependent on the sort of personality and vision of this particular Pope? Well, we have to be aware, you know, and it's, for me it's very important that I will just tell you briefly uh, a, a very strong experience at, I had at the synod, uh, the pre-synod on young people, the pre-synod with young people. So 300 young people from all over the world during one week, and they, they first have to, they, they are two days in small language group to reflect on different questions. And I was with the drafting committee. And um, when we, we have read all the synthesis coming from 26 different groups in six different languages, uh, what they, they have written about their vision of the church, what they want for the church, it was exactly the same words. And it was Pope Francis' vision. So what I want to say is that the, what Pope Francis is doing is not coming from Pope Francis alone. He is also doing that because that's exactly what the last two synods have, uh, have been shared, uh, have shared, you know. And when you see the impact, uh, I was so surprised and impressed by such uh, impact of my uh, appointment all over the world and in many different spheres. It is because it meets uh, people's aspiration everywhere. So most of the people in the church, but moreover, you know, they, uh, they have uh, uh, the vision of Pope Francis, and Pope Francis is clearly very close <laughs> and is listening to the people. Mm. So I, I think that the path in which we are, you know, it, it's we hope and we feel it's it's the path of the Holy Spirit for the church. So uh, it will continue. But change, we have to have in mind, and synodality implies it's about a conversion of mentality and also of structures. And it's, uh, it's also about uh, people, <laughs> you know. So you can't, Pope Francis alone can do nothing, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but he is expressing something that is, uh, I, I think that relies on um, a change of mindset, uh, uh, common discernment, and so we can hope that it will continue. I think it, I think you said somewhere that you know decisions made by synods can take sort of you know ten or fifteen years to roll out. And I just wonder whether you feel that people are going to lose patience with that 
pace of change, which I know in the light of eternity might seem like a blink of an eye, but to people waiting on the ground to for the church to change its mind on certain key issues around participation of women or on sexuality or on various things. Um, there's a huge amount at stake, isn't it? Because if you don't, if you don't move and get it right, you're in danger of of losing those young people that um, you've been speaking on behalf of. Yes, and it was uh, it's, it's very clear for the question of women, <laughs> because young people ask for uh, you know uh, more women leadership and. Uh, so, uh, so, so that's that's very clear. But uh, we have to. The problem is that we are in a society, also, you know, with a very short view, uh, short term view. <laughs> and uh, I, I can understand that some lose patience. But we have also to have in mind that when decisions or you know orientation are taken at the level of the universal church. For all the world, you know, and the problem is that often we look at the church only with our own lenses. We can understand it from our country, our culture, but there are many topics uh, on which, because of the cultural differences, the different histories, the different mindset, uh, it, it's not easy to find a consensus on some questions, you know. So uh, what you have to, we have to have in mind also that the, the way uh, is also to keep communion between a very diverse uh, church uh, with a great diversity, but it's from the beginning. You have four gospels telling the same story in four different ways for four different uh, communities. So the way that Pope Francis is taking is also you know, to emphasize uh, the local churches and some, uh, it, yes, it, it's, it's also, um, you can't regulate everything for everybody from uh, the center, you know, and Pope Francis is clear on that. Um, I'm going to hand over to Christopher again, and then um, please, those of you who'd like to ask questions, um, either put up a yellow hand or raise your hand or um, put something in the chat box and we'll go to you after in a couple of minutes. Christopher. Yeah, I've got a, just a couple more questions. Um, the first is how does the synodal um, method deal with disagreements and potential divisions? Because we're, this is in one in one level that's what we're seeing through this process we are seeing very different viewpoints coming to the surface um how do you, how does synod synodality deal with this how do you deal with say germany moving in one direction the usa going somewhere else um how how is synodality going to respond to, to these these divisions and disagreements that we are seeing when uh, one of the answer uh, given also by Pope Francis is about our conception and vision of what is unity and what is communion. Uh, and Pope Francis says, you know, we have to think about the church and all the, also the different local churches and the way to relate and to be in communion, not with uh, the figure, the, the idea of the sphere, but with the idea of the polyhedron, you know. Uh, so I think that, 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 that's key. But then we have, of course, on the main, uh, it's also the gift of the Catholic Church and some other religion or sometimes other denominations um, would like to have that <laughs> because you have infinite. Uh, the figure of the Pope as uh, the servant of communion, you know, that helps. Uh, but, but the, you know, we, we have to distinguish the different labels, what is truly the essential of the faith, and then uh, how to live the gospel in a, in a historical time, in a context. <laughs> and that means also. Uh, so Pope Francis, uh, I, I would say, as a more pastoral approach, you know, uh, that is uh, this listening also of the of the situations. But uh, for synodality, 
I mean, what we have to learn in the church, and it's not easy, but sometimes I say that in my community, it's normal to disagree on many, uh, many topics, you know, because we don't have the same education, the same formation, the, but how do we learn to be uh, peacefully, to, to peacefully disagree? <laughs> and I think that also a learning for the church uh, to accept that nobody alone has the, the best view. And synodality is truly about uh, looking for the truth. Well, I mean, seek, seeking the truth. And it implies, and that's what is difficult, it implies that you are open to a path of conversion, that your own views are, are not... Uh, uh, are not completely true, you know. Nobody alone can discover the truth. So uh, it, it's also, uh, I think, a great challenge to uh, find the way together to be in this uh, path of conversion, personal conversion and communal conversion. That means you accept, if you want the church to change, you first need to accept that you personally will, be, will change. <laughs> And that a synodal path is an open path that will transform you. Okay. And I, I can uh, share that from my experience of the, of the synod. Yeah. Um, Gemma Simmons, are you on the call? I am. And I'm sorry, Nathalie, how lovely to see you, that <laughs> I've had to come in late. I'm in the middle of a provincial council meeting, so I'm grabbing the lunch break to, <laughs> to be part of this. Nathalie, I suppose one of my questions as a theologian is to ask whose theological voices are we hearing? Because part of the fact that, you know, we accept and deal with disagreement is about whose voice is actually being heard, whose voice is being seriously invited. And my own experience in terms of discussions, for instance, of issues to do with women, is that there is often quite a limit to the theological voices that are actually being consulted and heard in terms of informing oneself and, and of people who speak in an official capacity in the church informing themselves before they speak. And so to me, it's a question of where are we looking for and finding the theological voices that are informing the debate and the discussion. Yes, thank you, Gemma, for um, uh, bringing that, because, uh, of course, it's very important to have in mind that in the church, you not only have the official hierarchical magisterium, but you have also a kind of magisterium of the theologians. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I can say is that in our secretariat and for the preparation of the next synod, it's very important for us to work with a good number of theologians men and women, uh, and I am very sensitive to that, to, to bring also uh, connections and uh, uh, with a woman theologian from different parts of the world, because that's also a key issue. Uh, and especially we are both in Europe, we are together in Europe, <laughs> but of course, Rome is in Italy. So there is a tendency, you know, sometimes it's easier to, but, uh, what is very important is also to be open to this diversity of theological approaches uh, and especially cultural diversities also. Um, and I can just uh, also, uh, you have probably uh, seen that, that it's a good news a few, just a few weeks ago, you know, uh, a sister from Spain, uh, a professor at the Gregoriana has been appointed secretary of the Biblical uh, Commission. So it, it's also an important uh, woman voice. And I think there are more, and, and today also uh, there was a new release about who will be part of the commission for the protection of minors. And you have many women uh, and also theologians. Gemma, can I just ask you, if, if you don't mind, um, I mean, how, how, from your perspective and those with whom you work, how the news of um, uh, Natalie's appointment and those of other senior women is being received? I mean, is it being seen as a sort of sea change? Is there a, a lot of optimism and hope around it or, or, 
what's the what's the mood i think the um the news of natalie's appointment to, uh, amid anybody who knows her is obviously fantastically good news and um you know people are very delighted i think to give it to to call it a sea change it's a little bit early i mean in many ways we've learned to be grateful for small things um and this is a step in the right direction but it's a step when you know huge journeys are needed so i i don't want to sound ungenerous in any way in being um, unappreciative because I am fabulously appreciative of the fact that someone like Natalie is in the position she's in but it feels very much to many women and women theologians I think too little too late um, you know better now than never but better it should have been 20 years ago or 40 years ago so uh, I think we should uh, I want to balance both huge um, encouragement and appreciation with not wanting to be complacent and thinking, okay, we've thrown a few, you know, scraps in the direction of the women, let alone, you know, the people of color or the people of non-European descent and everything else. Let's all keep going with, you know, the juggernaut because actually I do see Pope Francis as really wanting to change the juggernaut at depth, but he's got a limited amount of time. Uh, and I, I would like this to be the beginning of an avalanche, not the beginning of a trickle. Thank you. And, and I hope that doesn't sound ungenerous because I'm very appreciative of the importance of someone like Natalie being where she is. But um, there needs to be a lot more of this kind of change. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Ruth, I think you've got a question also on the subject of um, women, have you? Yes, I've, I've got a couple of questions, um, Natalie. Um, the first is, um, when uh, women were first ordained uh, in the Church of England, they met fierce resistance. Um, some people wouldn't take communion from them. They were shunned by other priests. Um, some people said they wouldn't serve under a woman bishop. I'm just wondering what resistance you find in the, in the corridors of power at the Vatican to a woman holding authority. Well, for the moment, you know, what I can say is that uh, I have been very well welcomed. Uh, I have received uh, also many me messages from uh, head of dicasteries, uh, people uh, I know in the Vatican or other people I don't know. <laughs> so uh, I, I didn't have a, a direct experience of resistance. I can imagine there are some, <laughs> but... Uh, it's it's not my uh, it's not my experience. So yes, that's that's what I can say for the moment. You know, I, yes, I have received a very well uh, welcome and lot of encouragement, support, and prayers. Well, that that's interesting in in itself. Uh, the the second question is. Um, We've, uh, we did an interview last year with Ruth Kelly um, from the UK, who was appointed amongst, I think, five other women to be on the Finance Committee. Uh, I forget the exact title at the Vatican. I'm just wondering, with all these women in top appointments, is there a women's group? Do you meet together? Well, uh, I know that uh, a few years ago um, there was the creation of uh, a kind of uh, group for women in the Vatican. Uh, but now also with the pandemic, you know, I think the activities are, uh, but I have heard about that. Uh, then, you know, I, I was lucky and I say, fortunately, fortunately, when I was appointed, I was not completely new at the Vatican because during my 10 years uh, of responsibility at the French Bishop Conference, I had to come to Rome regularly for some meetings. I had some links with the history uh, related to youth and vocation. Then I took part to the Synod of Bishops. 
so I arrived here, uh, I had a lot to discover, but I was already in relationships with people in different dicasteries and women. So of course, you know, uh, I, I meet them and we, we can, uh, we can share, but uh, not only women, because yes, for me, a great sign of hope, you know, and I have seen a change, uh, probably 10, 20, 10, even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the question of women in the church was mainly uh, a question from the women and uh, brought by the women, but more and more, the question of women leadership in the church is a question uh, from the men also, and also many priests and bishops, you know. I, I have received, I can't tell you how many messages I have received from priests and many bishops also from different countries telling me we are so happy with this appointment. So uh, the change will not only come from women <laughs> and, and the change will, will go on uh, because it's also the desire of more and more men to, to have this way to work together. Uh, and I hear that from many bishops also. Um, are there any other questions? If not, I've got another one, but um, I would like to invite anyone else who hasn't had an opportunity to ask one yet. If you do want to make yourself known to us, we'd love to take the question. Um, Sister Natalie, let's suppose I'm, I'm, I'm a local church goer. I just attend faithfully my parish church every week, as I've done for 50 years or so. Um, what difference do you hope I will see in my local church if this vision of synodality is um, is implemented and and, and really makes it makes movement? Well, you know, uh, the, the first thing, and as, as you say, is uh, is that this uh, vision of synodality is implemented in in. in in the parish and in different uh, places of the church. But in the parish, the first thing is uh, one of the main instrument for synodality is the parish council. So the question is, is there a parish council? And uh, how does it work? Uh, does the pastor uh, work with men and women in his parish council? Uh, and is, is it uh, so? And then how the parish council is listening to all the people and not only a few one, you know, who are very committed. Uh, so that, that's the way to do, you know, uh, and we can hope. And my hope is also because we can say that we have already a synodal way to be the church in many places. You know, for instance, I have been, uh, and I know in England, I have worked also with my uh, counterpart in England, when I was in charge of uh, university pastoral care, uh, university chaplaincies, you know, in, in most of them, you have a team uh, with men and women sometimes, uh, and even in England, the national responsible during many years was a woman like me in France. And we have this way to work together as a team in, in a partnership and co-responsibility with uh, young students. So this model is there, and you have that also probably in Caritas or uh, CAFOD in England. There are bodies of the church also. But uh, the problem is uh, in parishes with this model and pattern of a pastor, uh, even if there is a council, it's not mandatory. So the problem is that you can be a pastor in a way that is not very synodal, but now, if, if people, you know, disagree, they can go elsewhere. Yeah. So I feel that even a bishop or a priest nowadays can't do, uh, can't avoid, uh, you know, listening to, to the people. And I guess the training of, of priests is going to be, you know, what, what's happening in the seminary is to sort of equip priests to work in that synodal way. Um, is it too much to hope? Um, I mean, just with my with a sort of um, uh, my own agenda perhaps that one day the synodal process could lead to women's ordination 
I think it's well. It's very clear for Pope Francis now that it is not the it is not the way, <laughs> because the the key thing for Pope Francis and for uh, for the stage of the church is to get rid from a clerical church to also to prevent any, any abuses and to embrace this vision of a synodal church in which the leadership is no longer only connected to ordination. So uh, uh, what is interesting is that, and that was the synod on the Amazon, you know, there is a commission studying the question of uh, women deacons, okay? But uh, I feel we are in a creative path also to think and rethink about ministers uh, in the church and the, also the recent decision, you know, to appoint lectors and acolytes uh, that, that it could be also for women is uh, an interesting also uh, step because that's the first time that uh, a woman can receive, you know, an institutionalized uh, ministry. And uh, probably there is a, a call and discernment to do uh, to, uh, to be creative, to find different kind of uh, ministries. And the Synod on the Amazon called very clearly for a minister for women's leaders in uh, Catholic communities. But what will it be? We don't know yet. It's it's on uh, on this moment. Quick question from Christopher before I ask a final question. Yes, um, just looking at what synodality might mean in the long term. Do you think there could be a synod of the people of God in in, in the church alongside the synod of bishops? At the moment, it's a synod of bishops that, that meets in Rome. Could there be a synod of the people of God? Um, that, that gathers. Yes, we can we can hope, you know, that uh, especially this synodal path towards the synod of bishops, that uh, the path uh, drafted also by uh, Episcopalis Communio, uh, as uh, you can have uh, pre-synodal meetings with all the people, and we hope for that. And uh, it, it's also an inter very interesting uh, step and decision that after the Synod on the Amazon, to follow up uh, the implementation of the Synod of, of the Amazon, they have created not, they don't have created uh, an Episcopal uh, Conference of Amazonia, but an Ecclesial Conference of Amazonia. And the CELAM in Latin America is uh, this year, is uh, organizing a process for an Ecclesial Assembly of Amazonia. Uh, so we can really hope that these ecclesial synodal meetings can happen at many levels, the, in parishes, in dioceses, maybe in bishop conferences. Uh, in Rome, it's difficult to imagine, you know, <laughs> something so large, but uh, we, we will see. Uh, and we, we have all, already the experience of the last synods, even if they, they are clearly a synod of bishops, the fact that you have also auditors uh, who have uh, great roles uh, is, is also uh, an interesting experience. Um, we're going to have to leave it in just a moment, but I just want you to um, imagine yourself forward to that first time that you place your vote as part of the um, Synod of Bishops. Um, and I guess you, you may not know what the what the exact matter that you'll be voting um, under is, but can you think about what you will be feeling and what you will be praying as you place that vote? Well, you know, as I told you, I don't want to diminish the, the, the symbol and the, the very important of the vote, but as I told you, and that was also my experience, uh, if we follow this synodal way to take decisions, we have to be very aware that the vote comes at the end when a consensus has been built. So usually, you know, the, fi the final document of a synod is approved by almost 99%. Uh, 
So what is very important is, uh, I, I don't say that the vote is not important, but for me, it's, it's all the more important, you know, to be involved and to bring, uh, well, what you feel the spirit asks you to give uh, from the beginning of the process. And, and, and if you have only women who vote, who vote at, uh, women who vote at the end, but who are not part uh, of the process, you know, it, it's not interesting. <laughs> well, but it is a historic act that you're going yeah, to Yeah, yeah, yes, but I, I, I don't want to diminish that, you know, I don't want to diminish that. But I, I, I really feel, and that's why also, you know, I really receive this appointment. Uh, okay, it's on me, but it's not for me. And it's, it's, it's a fruit, you know, of a historic uh, process. Uh, and, and the fruit of so many women <laughs> before me. And, and uh, today, uh, you know, this appointment is not only for me and this vote will not come, for, you know, it, it's, it's broader. So, so that's why, uh, yes, I, I, I hope I could feel that this vote is, you know, just a way uh, to answer the call of God. Right, well, Miss Lever, thank you so much for being with us and for, for giving us your time and for um, speaking so eloquently in English. And um, thank you everybody else for joining us and uh, we'll be back for another Zoom before too long. Thank you very much, everyone.